Really excited to do this. Uh, I'm Alex Palmi, co-founder of Pathlight. With me is, is Patrick, uh, career sales development leader uh, to help impart some wisdom on, uh, on two things that, that, that often can be antagonistic, but I think Patrick and the Twilio team really does an incredible job of, of building a winning culture and a positive culture, but uh, not, not losing sight of the numbers and uh, taking a very data-driven approach. So first, uh, just to establish uh, Patrick's credentials, he's had a pretty incredible career. He's really good at picking companies. Um, he started uh, at Salesforce, I think, in 2004, yeah, something before. like that. Uh, he started as an SDR um, before it was cool. And um, <laughs> he left 10 years later as a, as a sales development manager. And I think during that time, Salesforce went from $96 million to $4 billion in revenue. So it was kind of that super exciting hockey stick period. And then you went to you had a brief stint at Anaplan yeah. where you you moved in inside sales management. Mm -hmm. You realized your heart was in sales development. It was really sales dev when it really yeah. came down to it. So and then you chose right. Twilio at an early stage, mm -hmm. uh, team being about twenty five SDRs. Yep. And now you're about one hundred and fifty. That's right. Um, worldwide across worldwide. you know four or five countries or something mm -hmm. like that. And then uh, I think plans to to nearly double that team over the, over the next couple of years, which which is great. So. You have been uh, in the trenches for a long time, um, <laughs> and you've seen the industry change, uh, and you've seen even a few generations kind of go through your door as well. Yes. Um, I think the, the, the kind of thesis that I want to, or the, 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 the topic that I really want to focus on is, is how you think about data-driven management. I mean, it's an incredibly measured role, um, mm -hmm. uh, and you've got goals, and you've got daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly goals, and how you... How you think about doing that job, but but building a winning culture as well. So the first thing I think is choosing what metrics to focus on. I yeah. think we're drowning in data right now, um, <laughs> and we've all got a million tabs in our browser. That's right. uh, and so I would love to start uh, and just ask you: How do you at Twilio think about choosing the right metrics, the right metrics that frontline employees and frontline managers are going to be focused on, um, sure. and how that and how that how that uh, affects the culture? Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty easy. And when, um, when you think about sales dev, I mean, for the most part, it has always historically been how many calls are you making, right? How many opportunities you create, maybe call time, right? Real basic frontline metrics that are the hustle metrics, right? Are you putting up the numbers? And I always think it's interesting over the years meeting more senior leaders who I've worked with, what kind of expectations they have in terms of what our teams will do. And you have some that are heavily focused on those hustle metrics and some who just want the production. I want the pipeline. I really don't care. So it's interesting you hear that. But you get that the hustle metrics is, is the number one. And I, and I think that's it's helpful. But you know, some, it was very easy for us to figure out, and this is actually my Salesforce days, that you know, I can really push activities. And I will get those activities. We had 50 activities a day. And at the end of the day, every single rep was at 50. And it always kind of chuckled. It's like they're not actually trying to max out their day. They're just trying to hit 50, right? So, okay, that was interesting. And then you start kind of digging into some of those activities and you start realizing, you know, they're not actually the right activities, right? They're not quality activities. They're just trying to hit that number. So that metric in and of itself just doesn't make sense, right? At Twilio, we've actually really started to focus more on productivity metrics. So things like the conversion rates, right? Speed to lead. How quickly we actually call a customer after receiving that lead. Take a look once again, those conversion rates by different products. Do they meet the conversion rate metrics that we expect of the team? And then you're also looking at, at your output metrics, right? Your conversion down the funnel in terms of, of the opportunities that you're, you start with your MQLs, turn into opportunities, opportunities that turn into uh, SQLs and then SQLs that actually end up closing, right? Are those opportunities going all the way down the funnel? And frankly, that's a much better guide to how well or how healthy your organization is. And this really came through in COVID, to be honest. Um, Twilio specifically was one of those, those COVID stocks. Um, people trying to work from home, you know, we provide uh, communication APIs and ability people to, to work remotely. So you saw this massive increase in business coming to Twilio. A lot of companies as well needing to be able to communicate with their customers in new ways and they couldn't see them face to face. So SMS and things like that became more important. Well, then you move into 22 and you find it's actually incredibly difficult to model 
what our targets should be when you had this massive quarter in Q2 the year before. And you have to be you know, intellectually honest and push that you're going to continue to grow, but that growth isn't consistent across all our products. And so what we found in this year, frankly, is, is some of the modeling is just not right. We don't really understand the market. You know, I think generally as, as a, an industry, we don't know what's going to happen and how people and countries are going to respond to the pandemic. So in many cases, we found ourselves you know, struggling to meet certain targets. And that obviously puts a lot of pressure on sales dev leadership, right? Why are the targets the way they are? Why are we pacing behind question, 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 question? And you, know, you can look at your team and you can say, hey, I think we're doing all the right things. But if you can demonstrate those, those metrics, those key productivity metrics, look at our conversion rates. Look how quickly we're following up with leads. Like We are doing the job we're asked to be doing. Something else is driving some of that change. And so that was really important in our, I think, evolution of thinking about what's important to track and to measure from a sales dev side of things. Now, when you're obviously looking deeper into a rep who has struggling conversion rates, well, obviously I'm going to look in what their activity looks like, what their hustle metrics look like. Those really then come into play of understanding, are they doing the right activities? Are they putting out the numbers they should be? What is driving that drop in conversion rate? So there, the, the hustle metrics are incredibly important. Once again, in and of themselves, they can be a false metric when it really comes down to it. There's so much more, especially I think on the inbound side of things. Our inbound engine is, is, is really huge at Twilio. We're dependent on leads for marketing. We're dependent on what they forecast. We build our targets based off of what they're projecting. So if there's something off in that model, we're really in a tough place to find success. Outbound's a little bit different, right? Outbound is, I think there's a lot more about hustle metrics. There's a lot more about relationship building with your AEs, collaboration that drives productivity. But I think in terms of culture in it itself as well, we're not talking about the metrics of just, hey, how many calls did you make? How many calls do you make? It's more about, hey, how do we improve your conversion? And we're having a more in-depth conversation about that it's a much better back and forth, right? Because it's, it, I can understand what you're trying to do. Hey, if we convert 1% higher, 2% higher, look, this ends up being X amount of SQLs. And that can actually increase you to 105% from being at 95%, whatever, whatever it may be. And so that then has this conversation more about building you up to be successful versus I need you to hit this number, right? Which translates to 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50. And that actually is a bad culture. Right? That's where people turn off. That's when people are just doing activities to do activities. Right? That's when you get, frankly, if the pressure's on heavy, people will put up activities that aren't real. Right? And now you've created a culture where there's so much pressure that reps do things outside of what they normally do because they're afraid of losing their jobs. And I've seen that at past companies. Right? And then you start getting into like, okay, now you're, now you're not intellectually honest. Now we have a problem. Right? So you don't want to feed into that culture, which it can actually happen by, by focusing on the wrong things. That's actually something that I wanted you to, to dig in on because I think you guys take a very sophisticated and nuanced approach to goal setting and expectation setting mm -hmm. and expectation communication and making sure that the front lines understand their expectations. So how do you think about the importance of setting those goals and communicating expectations as it relates to culture? Well, I mean, first of all, when we're, we all, all are a part of sales, right? It's incredibly important that we meet the numbers and that we hit targets, right? That is a major representation of what we do, right? If you're looking at a performance review or looking for a promotion, your numbers are going to be listed, right? And you need to explain those numbers. So targets is really important. And targets are not just about hitting the goal, right? It's also about motivating reps to find success. So give an example. Uh, in you know, summer months in Europe, we have massive amounts of PTO. So in Ireland, as an example, you have to have 25 days of PTO legally. In, in France, I think it's 30. Uh, and they all take it in like you know, July and August, right? So your whole team just gets destroyed, right? Excuse me. Um, and that can create some challenge, right? At the same time, our customers aren't, aren't around either. And so we've seen times where our inbound lead flow has dropped and the reps that are there have struggled to be able to meet targets. And it has been better for us to lower their targets and create a gap between our targets and in our deployed quota versus our company goals to ensure that the, mo the momentum is there and that the belief they can find success. I'm going to get more 
out of a rep or a team if they believe they can hit that target versus having a harder target they don't think they can hit. So I can have a target of, let's just say it's 40, I could drop it to 30, and my reps are actually going to overproduce that 40 number before. Right? We have accelerators built in there. We encourage that. We can throw in spiffs. Those type of things motivate those reps and make them believe that they can do it, which in most cases they can. But on top of that, it shows that you actually understand the challenges that they're going through. Like it's a hard job, right? It's like, I don't know, I remember my first year, it was like the best job I never want to do again. You know, like it was fun, exciting, met a lot of new people, new to a company and new to tech, new to San Francisco. Like it was really awesome. Oh my God, I'm in an office building. So cool, right? But man, it's a grind, right? And it's tough. So being able to, to you know, soften that, making sure that they keep that energy up is huge for the culture because the people who like it's the bad apple we talked about this before i mean it's really true the bad apple in the bunch really can spoil the rest i don't know if you guys have ever had that but someone who's lost motivation got some nods over here lost motivation and that's the debbie downer right that like in the lunch is talking bad things about the company and it, it brings everybody down it's like, God, like that's that's not good right obviously you don't want to get to that point and many times you have to remove that bad apple but you want to prevent that from ever happening, right? And making sure that they believe they can find success. So the, we've chosen metrics, we've set expectations, and now really where the rubber meets the road in terms of data-driven management is in coaching. Yeah. And how you can uh, uh, thread that needle, mm-hmm. obviously make sure that we are on target or we are getting back on target yeah. and, and, and hitting our goals, but also creating a winning culture. And of course, you know, the, in these SD organizations, this is their you know, first or second professional job and there's a career advancement agenda and they've got a career path that they're looking towards. So the coaching is so critical. Um, and I think having a, a front row seat to how you guys use performance management uh, in Pathlight, I think that the, the I think maybe a, one place to start is, is how you guys think about one-on-ones because you yeah. really think one-on-ones are important and you've got a pretty, I think, uh, strong opinion on what makes a good one-on-one and, and how often they should happen and what should be the agenda. Yeah, I mean, one-on-ones are, are key, right? It's, it's your time to have private conversation between the rep and the manager or whomever. Uh, so it's really important that that structure is strong and that it's, in, it's driving them forward towards their goals. So um, yeah, so we leverage Pathlight. And what's, what's great about it is it ties in for us the metrics to our one-on-ones and coaching conversations. So when we talk about pacing, we talk about conversion rates, we talk about speed to lead, the key metrics that we're focusing on, we're not talking that in terms of, have you hit this? We're talking about in that terms of their overall career and their coaching and development. Right? So every week we have the metrics already built into our kind of coaching one-on-one doc. We have the pace shown so we can see how they're doing, can see how they're pacing against their fellow teammates. And then we have a conversation about how they can improve their abilities, their capabilities, their success so that they can potentially move out of the role faster, put themselves in a position to be able to become the AE that they want to be, or maybe it's that raw job that's not in sales, whatever it may be. But the conversation isn't around like, you didn't hit 50. You need to hit 50 every day. Like that is nauseating, right? Like, and that doesn't feel like you're enabling me to get better at my job. But if you're focused on, hey, our ultimately the one-on-ones are around how we get you, we unblock challenges, and we get you moving closer to that goal of a promotion and interview and moving on. If you can align those things, then hearing about the metrics, hearing about how they're pacing against them is in this greater context of improving me and leading me on a path to success, which is getting promoted first and foremost for these reps, right? So it softened that conversation around metrics um, and it's expected. They know ahead of time in their visibility, exactly what metrics are listed, how they're pacing. So they're coming into it knowing everything that they're going to talk about is already visible. So in many cases, and what our ideal was in, in leveraging the tool is that reps would actually start digging into the tool themselves and start looking and finding some of these things on their own based on that coaching. Hey, I understand these metrics impact the conversations we're having and the direction and the next steps and many goals and little things that we can set that it just makes a much more collaborative conversation. And when you start seeing reps adding in topics, you know, ahead of time, I get a little notification of, you know, like so-and-so added these notes. I'm like, great. Like they're thinking about what they want to talk about. (sighs) Awesome. Right. I shouldn't be up there telling every single thing that's going on. Really. You should be bringing things to me ideally. And we've been able to do that. We've created that culture where 
reps are engaged in that one-on-one. They're adding the things that they want to talk about, uh, which has been much better than what I've seen in the past. Um, I think the ultimate one-on-one, and, and honestly, I don't think we're totally there, but is I don't have to do anything but respond to what the, what the, the rep is bringing to me, right? Like they're, they're so engaged. That's when you know you've nailed it, right? And they're asking questions. They're driving that conversation. They're outlining what their target is or what their goal is and are asking, how can I get there? How can I improve? And phew, that's a great conversation. That's a conversation that builds trust. That's a conversation that builds great relationships. And that's how you get these amazing you know, reps or, or employees that want to be there for a long period of time. They feel invested. Right? Like that's, that's so important. And I learned that more and more, in all honesty, during COVID. Being at home, and I'm very extroverted and very feely in many ways, a lot of hand movements. Um, I lost a lot of that during, during COVID. I uh, also have two kids at home that were not at school, which was really challenging. Two and, and four, that was pretty rough. And I didn't have that same connection. And it wasn't until recently of getting back to face-to-face again and, and just going, whoa, there's a gap here. You know? and, and I think, fr- frankly, the one-on-ones that we're using really held it together. And because we had a really good format there that allowed this great communication. Um, but I want more, right? I want more of that connection because that's the glue. That's the foundation of your success. If your reps are not successful and engaged, as we said before, they, they, they go bad. That's great. And so we're, we're, we were kind of covering data-driven management from a frontline manager to rep level, but then we think about from a director, VP to manager level, I think one thing that it's been exciting to partner with you on and, uh, is to actually start measuring uh, uh, the breakdown between positive communication, mm-hmm. what we call applause, and coaching yeah. uh, or critical communication. And so how do you think about that balance, especially you know, given your aggressive growth goals? Yeah, well, you know, I think one of the great things and what we've leveraged is giving the managers greater tools to be able to understand their reps and better understand if what they're doing is successful. I, re- I just remember early on when we started leveraging Pathlight, uh, one of my managers came to me and was just like, I'm really frustrated. I've been coaching this rep for quite a long time. And like, I, I just don't know if it's working. Like, I, I, you know, I don't know if she's really doing better. And then right away, we were able to go in there and just look at the pacing between last month and this month. And the rep was about eight or 9% higher in pace month over month. And I was like, look, at the same day. And this is like in, 30 seconds. It was amazing. Uh, not to toot your heart, but it was awesome. Uh, right away, I was like, look, you are ha- being effective in what you're doing. Right? And you can see that uptick. And that like, built up that manager. I'm like, all right. Because you know, managers in sales dev got in sales dev for a reason. Right? It's usually like one or two things. Right? Either they're wanting to get up into other forms of management, and this is a way they could do it. Or they love sales development. They love the coaching aspect and what they can impact on young sales talent. So getting that feedback of going like, I am doing something and I can see it in data is empowering, right? That's what got my reps, my managers, excuse me, to start diving into the tool more and to really start to sink in is because they saw they could show what the reps were doing. Now, if you look at that in terms of applause or in terms of coaching, it gives you a lot of different capabilities, especially when you think about performance management or providing performance reviews, really being able to see what's working and what's not but also be able to show trends, you know, see how that rep is doing over time and be able to use that as a driving conversation is really important, right? And how the managers respond to those changes is key, right? I I remember early on as a frontline manager, you know, a rep was struggling and it went like two weeks or so before I actually found out what was wrong. And I remember we had a conversation, we fixed it and rep was right back where they needed to be. And I just remember just being beat up, beat up by that. I was like, that rep struggled for two weeks because I didn't see it, right? I wasn't able to identify it. And so having these visual forms that allow you to be able to see the slowdown, pace changes, or even being proactively notified that, hey, you, you should take a look at this, right? Allows the managers to be able to be so much more effective in a much quicker time. And in those, even those small couple minutes you have between meetings where 
you know, rep comes up to you and asks you a couple questions and you don't really have that downtime. You know, you got like two minutes. Like, what can I do in two minutes just to see what's going on? And being able to see top players and low players on how they're pacing and performing just with the click of a button. I, okay, those are the two reps I need to focus on. Okay, that's, that's what I'm going to do in the short time that I have. All right, let me send some notes. Let me provide some coaching. Let me cheer them up. Let me create a mini goal. Like those things allow you to be more effective in a much quicker you know, space of time. So when we think about scaling the organization and getting the organization to grow, we feel a lot more confident in that we have this much greater communication capability to be able to build these reps up and ensure that they're successful. One of the things that we have done that's been fantastic is we ramp reps really well. And so through our onboarding process in the early months, our reps become really successful. And that's a real key metric to how well the organization is doing in bringing on these, these young salespeople. So last question, they want to open it up for sure. questions from the audience. And we're also in between them and lunch. So um, that will be efficient here. Uh, but <laughs> on, on that topic of, of ramping, you guys have grown really quickly. You have some pretty aggressive headcount goals uh, looking forward. Um, and now you've got a new generation walking through your door. Yeah. And so when it comes to culture and management, how is that, how is your framework changing, thinking about this next generation of, of employees that you need to hire in order to hit and, and, and obviously promote and be successful in order to hit your goals? Yeah. I, I mean, so it's been what, 16, 17 years or so I've been doing sales or sales dev, whatever it may be, man, when I started and when I was interviewing reps for my teams, um, when we were interviewing reps as well, uh, money was the number one thing that, that reps would say that they were in sales for. Like, I want to make money. Don't see that at all anymore. Right? I want to make an impact. Um, I want to you know, be valuable to the company. I want to feel pride in what I do. It's very different. Occasionally, I will get someone who will admit that money is important, but they apologize for it, which I think is interesting. But, well, you know, it's, it's not that's the most important thing. And I, and I kind of always chuckle. I got, I got two kids and a mortgage. I got to pay it somehow, right? So, like, <laughs> money is important, but that doesn't mean greed is good, right? And so those are two very different things. So their view on that is, has changed a lot. Um, and you see this with, with, you know, the questions they ask us is very, it's interesting. Right? They want to know about our values. What's your favorite value? How have you used that value? Right? Like, is this a company that actually falls through with the values they put on their website? Because right? that's a, you know, a lot of people can put that up on the website, but not everybody executes on it. So from us as a, as a team, we've had to make adjustments in terms of how we cater to that group. Right? So everything from the interview experience, we're constantly checking on how we can get a good interview experience. Ralph was just talking about this a moment ago, right? You don't see the, the note cards as much anymore, right? You don't see the thank yous as much anymore. One of the things that we pride ourselves on, even though we're constantly trying to get better, is we have people have given us thanks consistently, even when they don't get accepted in a role. The process is really good, but we still have had to make adjustments to that. We're making it shorter, smaller, right? We have limits around how much time before we give a response. So the pressure is on us to create this amazing experience for them. And frankly, they can go other places. There are a lot of jobs out there right now. There's a lot you know, looking for sales development organizations. So we have to change that approach in terms of catering more to what they want as, as that generation is, is, is growing up. But I do think it's also important that you know, there's a, there's a fine line as well of, of what they want and what they need to learn. So when they come on and Twilio is, a, is very different from what Salesforce was. Salesforce is a little bit more, I don't want to be mean about it, but, but cutthroat vir virtually in terms of how they dealt with employees. Twilio is very different, much more focused on make sure you're developing these reps a, as well as possible. And that's fantastic and I love it, but not every company is like that. And tech is a real tough industry. And once again, it's about numbers and it's about performance. So we also have to coach them on not only what we do, but what the industry does and provide them context of, is it good or bad? Maybe, you know, one or the other, but these are realities you're going to run into and that you need to be prepared for them. And, you know, what goes on in sales dev is just an entry point to the rest of your sales career. And Every step of the way, you're getting a little less coaching, a little less coaching, a little less coaching. So we want to you know, instill in them a good understanding of 
what it's like out there and, and what to be prepared for. And um, I think they really appreciate that insight, though you have to walk a fine line on that. You don't want to be harsh on them and giving them too much of the real world, but you want to make sure that they're aware of what it's like out there. At least I do. I, I think it's important. You know, I, I want reps to leave my team or leave Twilio feeling that they are better prepared for that next job, whether it's in sales or something else. And we've got to do that with everything. Like, like Ralph said, like your appearance matters. Like it, it does. So when you come into an interview, you should look the part. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of people who come into interviews and they don't look the part, you know, and it's, it's, it's a different generation. So we're okay with that. We're a little bit more lax, but you know, if you go into a finance role or something like that, it's not going to fly. <laughs> so um, you got to make sure you're teaching them. Any questions for Patrick? We got time for one question one before question. the lunch stampede. Sorry, I blew the <laughs> Hey, Patrick, thank you for the time. Sure. Uh, my question's around remote culture building. So before COVID, we could all have the blue and gold fleet spiff and get your team to Sam's if you hit the monthly spiff, right, in person. So how, with the 13 offices around the world, are you building a remote culture to feel like the team is a team and not just the one-on-ones through Pathlight, right? That, that's, to me, one of the biggest challenges in the last 12 months. And I'm curious about your opinion and viewpoint on that. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, we have reps that have never been in the office. They have, they have no connection to what in-office culture is like, right? And like the bonds you get from the people you run into in the office and you work with. So uh, it's very different. Um, I mean, we started off by doing some of the basic stuff right, is doing team gatherings, doing happy hours remotely, right, doing uh, escape rooms, uh, doing art projects, right, everyone bought the, got the same little art project and we did it together, cooking classes, things that you could do in an environment. And, you know, some of them were pretty cheesy, I'll be completely honest, but we still liked them, right? It was still something different, right? And then, like, you appreciated the, the, the effort and the change. Uh, in Slack, we leverage Donut, which is a capability that every you know, day or so you get hooked up with somebody you don't know, and then you end up having a one-on-one in the conversation. Um, we also try to do ways to elevate different reps and, and get them more exposure to, to whether it be senior management or other people on the team um, to get out there. And whatever possible, if we could do something that was socially distanced, we tried to. Uh, we had a lot of restrictions early on. We could not meet employees face to face but as things kind of slowed down we encouraged those that were were interested to to get together uh but in honest it is very hard um and the one thing i really learned in that process is that you have to pay attention to small signals you have to make sure that you take the time to ask questions around their own health and seeing it that people handle challenge or stress or whatever else you want to call it, very differently. And like mental health is a very interesting thing. But when you're locked down in many places, and many other countries had it way worse than we did, um, that literally couldn't go certain places. I think it was like Ireland, you could go five kilometers, and they would have checkpoints and check your, your, your license, crazy stuff. Um, those people had it really, really hard. And I'll tell you, it, it really opened my eyes to, you need to take some extra time and, and just have a conversation. And I would say just picking up a phone and give somebody a call, not on Zoom, and have nothing to talk about that's work-related. Just like, how are you? Just even five minutes. All right, just want to check in on you, see how you're doing. Cool. No, we don't need to talk about work. We can talk about that in a one-on-one. You doing good? Great. Like, something really small like that makes a big difference. And it's nice not to have to do that damn screen. <laughs> it's so old. You're welcome.